Good morning. Welcome to church, everybody. It's great to see you. Here for the early bird catching the worm. Once you come, stand to your feet. We're going to uh, start with some worship this morning. So let's praise the name of Jesus. You came along, the 
put me back together And every desire is now satisfied Here in your love
lift up your name. Because you're holy and you are mighty and you are glorious. You do change our world. You do change our circumstances. You do bring the light in the darkness. You bring hope to the hopeless. You're the father to the fatherless. You're healing to the broken. God, we honor you above all else. Thank you for all that you mean and all that you will do. In the name of Jesus. I worship you, Lord. Well, why don't you take a minute, say hi to folks around you? Just running, running microphone check. <laughs> Good to see you this morning. Welcome to church. Great to have you with us. If you're visiting with us today, welcome. Special welcome to you guys. I hope you have a good morning with us. Good to see some returning visitors as well as some old faces. I'm not looking at anyone when I say that. Sorry. I, I, oh, <laughs> old faces. <laughs> I don't know who you're pointing at, Carl, but anyway. <laughs> oh, looking straight at you. I don't know. Old faces. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's great to be here in church. Great to see you this morning. Um, sunny day, hey? How about that? I, it's so weird. I, I don't know. I'm still not used to seeing the sun. I don't know if you guys are, but it just feels so odd to me. Well, today we have Pastor Carl giving the message, which I'm really looking forward to. So that's going to be wild and, and on fire and changing the world. Um, so that's uh, looking at our second session on the seven signs. So looking forward to that a little later on. Uh, right now, though, we are going to worship God with our tithes and offerings. And to help us to do that is one of our board members, JR. Let's give him a big Woo! hand. Good morning, church. Thank you, Shovi. Make me carry the real Bible. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's start with 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. We have to be cheerful giver. Right. How I give is very how I give is very important than how much I give. And uh, one thing you know, I notice in my uh, spiritual journey. Um, about giving is um, giving area has many things hidden there. There's a purpose behind it. It's not just about money, not giving only. It's about pleasing God. So it's not about just giving money. Uh, to become a cheerful giver, there are some fundamental principles to understand. Once we under understand that, our attitude towards money changes and it makes us easy to be a cheerful giver. Okay, let's go to the next one. It's good to know what you should possess and what you shouldn't possess. What and also good to know what belongs to you and what doesn't belong to you. So if you are attached to something, it's very hard to give it away. You imagine a thing you have which you like. If I ask, Rusty, give me that. You will be reluctant, definitely. So don't get attached to that. So 1 Corinthians 10, 26. The earth is Lord's and everything in it. So everything in the earth is God's. It's not ours. Right. Now, Bible does not use the words earth and world in the similar way, same way. Earth is different, world is different. What comes into mind means, earth means we think world. World is different. World. It's, take world, my left hand. World speaks about the system. The world system. And earth, 
on my right hand does not belong to the devil, but world belongs to the devil. He is the ruler. But in the Bible, you can see uh, the devil is not called to rule the earth. Earth is still God's. Now, the, we know now, earth belongs to God. Earth is a material thing, like a lot of things, minerals, everything, cattle, everything. So, trees, plants, vegetables, all belongs to God. In that same sense, if you read verse 25 on the same 1 Corinthians 10, he says, you can eat anything sold in the meat market. So you can, see, whatever in the earth you allow, it's yours. You can enjoy, you can have it. That's why we give thanks when we pray. Even yesterday also I visited one friend of my house for a meal. We prayed. Prayed for the food. Grace. No. So, uh, 1 Timothy 6, 7, we see, we brought nothing. 1 Timothy 6, 7. We brought nothing into the world. We cannot take anything out of it. If money belongs to us, we would have to say God is stealing from us. Right? The, this is the point we should understand. There's an important point there. God allows us to have this. In our lifetime, we earn a lot of things, a lot of money. Yes, we got the love, we have it. But it was a loan. You can't have it, you can't possess it. Deuteronomy 14, 23, we, we see tithing was to put God first. So it's not about 10%, but what we read, what simply reading, you say, oh, 10% we had to God, 90% is mine. It's not about that. If you go further reading, you'll say, uh, you'll see, it is about, the teaching is about, it's all about putting God first. God is first for us. Get the order right. Even in my life, I've practiced, it works well with me. First God, then my wife, then the children, okay, get the order right. Always might get the order right. So 100% belongs to God. That's the attitude we should have. So this understanding will deliver us from all possessing, whether our attitude to money, attitude to our everything. So we can give a cheerful give up. We can't possess that belongs to God. I'm going to finish in it. That's why Jesus said, you can't be my disciple unless you forsake all your possessions. Luke 16, 13 says, you cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon means not only money, it's about all material things, your whatever, earthly riches. See, I'm not saying, don't get a wrong thing when I say, it doesn't mean you sell your car unless you sell your uh, house today, go home, sell everything and be a beggar. No, no, no. Manage your thing, but don't get attached to it. <laughs> don't possess it. God bless you all. Let me pray and finish. Lord and Heavenly Father, thank you for helping us to understand the loan, what you are giving us, what you have given in the earth, all belongs to us. Thank you for that, Lord. But when we leave this earth, we are not going to take it with us, Lord. We came empty and we are going to go empty, Lord. Thank you for giving that understanding and help us to be cheerful giver. Uh, and to build your uh, kingdom in the future. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Jan. It's all very quiet when you walked away. Let's give Jan a bit of a warm, you know. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. God loves a cheerful giver. Here's an here's a interesting thought for you. If you're not cheerful as you give, don't give. <laughs> I've been quite serious there, actually. You know, if you're not cheerful as you're giving, just don't give it. <laughs> just don't give it. Like we, I mean, well, we don't. We don't actually want your money. That's never been what we've ever wanted. Uh, we're, giving for us has always been worship to God. Yeah. And so, if your worship to God is is cheerful, that's a good worship to God. If your worship to God is grudging and grumpy. Don't do it. <laughs> like, it's not really going to do God any, any favours and, and, and nor us. So, you know. All right. So uh, for some reason, that, that speaker's working and that one's not. So if you're sitting over there and it feels very muffly, 
I apologize for that. <laughs> but we'll figure it out some other time. Hey, we're going to uh, shift to communion right now. Uh, for those that are visiting with us, we share communion every week. It's part of our, our worship, part of our practice. And um, uh, so just to let you know that uh, this is a, uh, a bread and wine that we share, um, but also if you are someone who would prefer to stay at your seat, I understand that at this moment that's what a lot of people would prefer. So um, just indicate to Jayan or uh, Gita, whoever's doing that, Jayan today, he'll bring a at-your-seat version to you, um, and then you can uh, share your communion without having to come forward and share with us. All right, well... Communion, I think, if, when we share it every week, we, we tell the same story. But it's a really important story. And so I'm happy that we tell the same story. Because it's, it's the beginning story of us as Christians. And, it's a, and it's, it is the most significant story for us as followers of Jesus. And it's so, it's so significant that it was passed on from generation to generation and has been passed on from generation to generation in the same way, in the same method, using the same things for the last 2,000 years. And so when Paul, the Apostle Paul, is writing to the Corinthian church, uh, he said this, I received from the Lord what I'm also passing on to you, that on the night when Jesus was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after the supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's such an important part of our Christian life to remember that Jesus died but also that Jesus rose again and that Jesus ascended to go be with the Father and that one day Jesus will return. It's so important. Every, everything else we do hinges on this one truth, everything. If there was no resurrection, you know, Paul says in another letter, we are the most pitiful of people because we believe in, in something. We, we sacrifice all these things in, the day, in our daily and our weekly life for nothing if there is no resurrection. And so when we remember this moment, Jesus' blood and body, we remember that there is a resurrection, that Jesus, we proclaim it, in fact. We don't just sort of remember it, but we proclaim it by our action, by our movement to the front. Jesus died. Jesus rose again. Jesus ascended to be with the Father. And one day, Jesus will return. And he, we will return with him. So as you come forward, remember these things and put them at the heart of who you are as a Christian person. Remember what he did and put them at the heart of who you are as a believer in Jesus. Um, so in a moment, we'll share that together. So let's just pray. Today, Jesus, we take this moment to remember very dramatically. <laughs> we take this moment to remember, God, all that you've done, all who you are. We love you. What you laid, you laid down your life for us as a pure act of love and grace. You continue, God, you rose again and you continue in heaven to, to be with us. You said you'd be with us till the end of the age. And that moment, that end of the age, that moment when you return, that is what we cast our eyes on now and look forward to. And so when we share this moment, Jesus, we, we proclaim that in our heart and we proclaim that with our body. We proclaim that with our mind. You are our saviour. You gave your life. You rose again. You will come again. We pray for all these things in the name of Jesus. Let's stand, church. Amen. Why don't you come forward and share communion with us? just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. Oh, I'm not here for blessings. 
Nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. Caught up in your presence, I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy.
loving, ever merciful, forever just. Pastor Carl, a warm welcome as he shares the word of God to us today. Good morning, church. Okay, now I do apologize. I actually, um, I actually pray with props. I've got my chocolates. And there's a reason why I do that. That is to distract you people. I can quickly talk. <laughs> Amen. So I got in my other prop. I have a, sometimes my eye just, you know, water just, I, I, I don't know what it is. But yeah, God will heal it in Jesus' name. <laughs> um, before um, Pastor Joel was 
was saying, why am I pointing to Russ? And um, the truth is, Russell's team is killing it in the con. <laughs> I thought I'd mention that. <laughs> uh, well, good morning. I hope that you guys have had a great, uh, great week, um, regardless of whatever has happened in your life. You know, God is good, and Jesus is still king. So before we start, I'm just going to pray first. Father God, as we listen to your word... We pray that you open our eyes and our ears. You strengthen us, Father God, and you strengthen me as I speak, Father God. We speak to glorify your name in Jesus. Amen. Okay, so um, last week, Pastor Joel was excellent, excellent preach. Unfortunately, we couldn't get it on video. Video, very sad. So for you that was not here, well... You missed it. (laughs) Anyway, last week, Pastor Joel was talking about Jesus' first miracle is changing uh, water into wine. And uh, we're continuing on the seven signs. So I'm talking about when Jesus heals uh, an official son. So, uh, yeah, thanks again, Sean. You may uh, bring the Bible. I had to run and find one. <laughs> okay, so uh, John 4, 43 to 54. Now, this is a story about an official that his son was, um, well, was dying, and he wanted Jesus to heal him. But there's actually much more to the story. So um, after two days, he left for Galilee. Now, Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country. When he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, for they also had been there. Once more, he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went up to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. Unless you see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. The royal official said, sir, come down before my child dies. Go, Jesus replied, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. While he was still on his way, his servants met up with him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, Yesterday, at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had told him, Your son will live. So he said, He and his whole household believed. This was a second sign. Jesus performed performed after coming from Judea to Galilee. So it is interesting to me that right at the end of the verse, they say this is the second sign. So I thought to myself, why would they mention that in, in this text? Then I realized they are actually saying, it's like what Pastor Joel said last week, Jesus hadn't healed anyone. At that time, no one had to be risen from the dead. You know, no one had to be, to have um, demons cast out of them. So, in saying that, it shows that the official had what I call audacious faith. You know, he had only heard about, maybe he heard about Jesus turning water to wine, but he didn't really have a concept that Jesus could actually heal anyone. Yet he was willing to put that all on the line to trust Jesus. So I had to find the, the, the word audacious. And I'm sorry, you know, sometimes I need to go to the dictionary of Google. And it gives you what it means. <laughs> so audacious is showing a willingness to take surprisingly bold risks. And, you know, all of us who are parents, we have children. And 
we will do anything for our kids. It's, it's you know, nature that we do that. And um, I think when uh, my daughter, Pauline, she's, she's the second youngest. <laughs> <laughs> That was part of the distraction. <laughs> anyway, yeah, you can see how big Pauline is. She's tough and she's... But <laughs> that was a compliment. But um, Pauline was very sick when she was young. So when she was like three, going up to a couple of years, I think, I, I had to take Pauline nearly every week to the hospital. She either had a fever or she was really sick. So my wife does not like needles. She, she doesn't like needles. I don't know how she got her vaccinations, but she doesn't like needles. <laughs> so every time I was the one, when it came to needles, I was the one to... So I, I'm holding Pauline, and I think the first time it caught her off guard. So I think the following week when I had to take her again, she needed another injection. Before the poor doctor came to her, she was saying, bad doctor, bad doctor. <laughs> so when your kid cries like that, you, you inherently want to do something. But I knew that she needed this injection. So I said, don't worry, you're going to go to Macus. I don't want Macus. <laughs> bad doctor. <laughs> so I managed to calm her down and, and she got an injection and, you know, and that was that. But what I'm trying to say is this official... And, and if you understand who he is, an official is, is an important person. You know, he has slaves. He has people that are under him. He doesn't actually talk up to anyone. He talks down to them because he's an official. Yet at this point in time, and it says in the script, he was begging. He was begging for, his, for Jesus to heal his son. So you can imagine an official, a person, most important person that will humiliate himself to be lower than a servant, to beg Jesus to heal his son. And I kind of um, understand what this official was doing because, you know, as, as a parent, we always, we always want to do well for our kids. We want our kids to, you know, sometimes I think we, we baby our kids too much. And um, I, I remember someone saying, strong people create Good environments, but good environments create weak people. And that's so true, you know, because we're inherently worried that our kids will go through things that will hurt them, we will try to hurt for them instead of letting them fall, instead of letting them find out what life is about. So it was amazing for this, this, um, this official to, to actually you know, lose himself, be willing to, to humiliate himself, you know, to, to, for Jesus to actually heal him. So with this audacious faith, I just wanted to talk about a couple of people that I know that have, you know, I call crazy faith. People that are, you know, half glass empty type people. And, and the first one, my wife. <laughs> So you guys know my wife, she, she, she loves to pray. And she's crazy when she prays, you know. It's, it's, it's audacious faith. Anyway, um, I'm going to tell you a story. About uh, two and a half years ago, I had a call from my brother's wife. Yes, I have a brother who I don't see. He only visits me once a year. I, think, I don't know why. But I love my brother. <laughs> I love my brother. Who doesn't love their family? Anyway, um, the wife is hysterical, and, and she calls, and she says, um, Ronnie um, is not doing well. And the doctor said, they're waiting. And I said, waiting for what? Because uh, I'll just give you a background on my brother. My brother is a workaholic, and unfortunately, that's part of our family. We are workaholics. But my brother, he works seven days a week. He has two jobs. So from Monday to Friday, he will work his welding job. It was a pretty heavy job, and 
very physical. And then on Friday to Sunday, he does security. So he doesn't rest. Sometimes he, instead of going home, he will sleep at the park and wait until his other shift and then go back to work. And when he does security, he does security in the evening and night, sometimes in the day. So he works. And, you know, when I talk to him, if he ever called me, it's all about, oh, I'm working this, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. So how oh, good on you, brother. Anyway, I believe the body was tired. It just gave up. So, okay, Anna said, let's go to the hospital. I didn't say to go to the hospital. She did. I love my brother. So we went, to, we went to the hospital. We get in there. And when we get there, I was actually going to bring a picture, but I didn't want to scare you guys. My brother was lying in the bed, and there were machines everywhere. And then we asked the, the nurse, or actually the doctor. Actually, Anna was asking, sorry, because I don't ask. Anna was asking every question. And Anna said, what's going on? And the, and, and the doctor said, every machine that you see is working each part of his body. Everything was failing. His kidneys were failing. His heart was failing. His, his lungs were failing. And each machine was working the body to make sure it continues to work. And I'm sitting there days, and I'm thinking, this is one of the guys that is so strong, and now I see him lying there helplessly. So, obviously, Anna will start asking questions. In your experience, has there any be anyone that has ever come from this? Because the doctor said, we're just waiting. And the doctor was thinking, and he said, there's a couple before she could even finish her sentence. And I said, I'm going to take that. I'll take that. I'll believe that he's going to get better. So then Anna, yeah, it's always Anna, it's not me. Anna said, do you mind if we pray? And um, the doctor said, yes, you can. So, yeah, we didn't do one of those heal and Jesus. You know, we didn't do <laughs> We didn't want to scare the, the nurses and the machines, so probably. <laughs> anyway, Anna, Anna's at the head and I'm at the feet. And then we start praying under our, our breath, speaking in tongues. And I didn't see it, but Anna said every time a nurse or doctor walked by, you could see them nodding, like a green, like they're Christians. Like, I, I now know that there's a lot of nurses and Christian, um, doctors that are Christians in the hospital but they won't say it. Um, I do dialysis. So I have this nurse that is usually with me, and she came up to me one day whispering, are you a Christian? I said, yes, I am. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> because I want to tell people I'm a Christian. I'm not going to be, you know. Anyway, the reason why I'm saying this is Anna's faith is so strong that when she did that and when we were praying, for the first time in my life, and I pray a lot. I feel God's presence. This time, it was different. This time, it was like you could feel God hugging you and saying it's okay. Like, it was a really heavy presence of God in that place. So, after we prayed, we went home, and the, and the wife was hysterical. She said, oh, I'm going to lose Ron. I can't believe it. But Anna and I was, were thinking, no. Nah, He's going to come back. Well, Anna was thinking, I'm really sorry. Anna was <laughs> And sure enough, the next day, the doctor said, he's actually starting to come out. He's starting, you know, some of the organs are starting to use less of the machine, but more to be on their own. And I thought, well, God is, you know, God is faithful. God is, all we have to do is to tap into that faith. And like you said, the same spirit that raised Jesus to life is in us. We just, we, we have a lot of things that go on in life. And our faith doesn't just grow because of one thing. There has to be a whole lot of things that has to happen for us to be faithful. So when Anna, when Anna does things, it's, you know, there's a script in the Bible, the more you hang out with someone, you become that person. And the more I see Anna do things, you know, she does 
crazy things that I wouldn't do. Our first house, for example. She went in and asked for a loan, and I didn't have a job. It's, who does it? You know, in the natural, <laughs> in the natural you think, and when that happened, she was walking with one of the ladies that we had connect with. And this lady is actually not all there. She's, she's a bit, she's not challenged, but she's a bit schizophrenic, you know. So when they were walking, and I felt the Holy Spirit said, go inside and ask for a loan. She said to this lady, God told me to go in there. And the lady said, oh, I thought I was crazy. <laughs> you are crazy. But that's it, audacious faith. How much are you willing to, to trust Jesus? And, and I understand that we go through a lot of stuff. You know, your faith can be up here today. And then tomorrow, something can happen to your family members. And, you know, you, you feel deflated. But that's the great thing when you have someone with you like a partner that prays. You know, we have a connect group. And every time our connect group shares a testimony, it strengthens me. It, it makes me think, well, God is still faithful. He's still working. And through these things, I get to understand his love. You know, in James uh, 1, 2 to 4, it says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may, you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. That's a crazy scripture. You know, consider, you know, when you, pure joy, consider it pure joy. It's not joy. It's, who, who has joy in, in, in pain? No one does. But what did Jesus do? He went to the cross for you. He gave his life for you. And, and that's why, you know, I am so honored that he did that for me. Um, the second person that, that I, I find has audacious faith, and this wasn't because it started with faith. She actually had to meet Jesus. As my sister-in-law, Nicole, she's not here at the moment. She's doing work in, in Victoria. Anyway, Anna, again, was the one saying to, to Nicole, come to church. And Nicole always said, no, you, you're, you're a cult. You're not real. <laughs> so Anna took her to, to, a, to a session. And this is when we were at Stratfield. And, and, you know, when the pastor, it was a, foreign, a pastor from overseas. He was praying and people were falling down. And Nicole was saying to herself, oh, that's not real. I'm not going to fall. She was actually pregnant at the time. I think it was late London. The funny thing is, God met her. And she walked up. Before she even got to the front, she was on the floor. And, and she talks about it and she laughs about it. But from that time, she started a business. And her business is actually founded on God. Everything she does, she trusts God. When she started the business up, Every morning, they will pray before they start. You have her workers thinking, this lady's crazy. What do we have to pray? I don't pray. But she got them to pray. So today, if someone comes into a clinic and they're going through stuff, regardless who they are, Muslim, Hindu, Christian, non-Christian, they will pray and lay hands on that person. That's how, that's how powerful the faith that she has. I think um, about four, four weeks ago, she wanted to quit smoking. And she went to the thing that she knew that would stop her from smoking. She turned to us and said, do you mind praying for me so I can quit smoking? So we prayed for her, and she hasn't touched a cigarette. You know. Now, I know you're hearing about these stories. Oh, those are those people. No, that can be you. It can. You, can, you just have to trust. Have faith. And the thing is, when God answers the prayer, there's a scripture where it says, God will answer your prayers according to his will. The according to his will is where we forget. Because we want God to answer the prayer. You give me money. You give me that. You do this. I don't like this person. Get him out of here. <laughs> yeah. God doesn't do that. He doesn't come to every whim or whatever you feel like. Because God is God. But he will answer 
the way he knows that it will help you. That, you know, good God loves you. According to his will means he will give it lovingly to you that it will actually help you. And I, I've understood that. I've had some prayers answered. And when they've been answered, God doesn't answer just that prayer. He answers like nine things after that. And that's the amazing thing about my God. Anyway, I just wanted to say one more thing. When you have audacious faith, it must accompany with audacious prayer. You must pray into that faith. So for some of you, uh, I don't know, every time I get up here, I feel like I'm talking about my life. <laughs> it's like a session with a psychiatrist. <laughs> but it's good, isn't it? it you know, it, it, I'm actually, so I prayed for a wife. And um, a lot of people, when you pray for your wife, are like, I would like a, a woman to love me, love my family, help me send money to my family. You know, a woman that loves me. That's what. Yeah. <laughs> Lorenzo knows. <laughs> this was my prayer. And it was a desperate prayer. And it was an honest prayer. And please don't laugh. I said to God, I, I, I've now looked after all my, my cousin's kids. I want a family. So God, I want a wife that's half Asian and has small feet. <laughs> okay, half Asian, uh, I kind of like Asian women. Sorry. <laughs> the, fe <laughs> the feet, island women, God didn't really bless them with small feet. I'm sorry. And I don't see any island women here except for my wife. She's got small feet. The reason why I, did, I want small feet because I don't want my wife to share my Jordans, you know. <laughs> I don't want to, hon, where's my shoes? It's a, Give me my shoes, <laughs> you know. <laughs> they can share everything else but not on shoes. Anyway, that is what I'm trying to get to you guys. The audacious faith is accompanied by audacious prayer. And we should trust in God. I know at times when you look at your situation, it doesn't look like it's going to happen for you. But I can tell you now, it will happen. You know, just recently we've been praying for Scott's dad. He went to the hospital. And we've been pressing into it. And he's out of hospital. God does so stuff that it's just ridiculous. Audacious faith. The final scripture I wanted to to give to you is um, in uh, John 20, 31. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So that's, that's who our Jesus is. We have to have that faith that we believe. And even if you feel it's not going to happen, it will happen. One of the, the faith prayers my, my, my crazy wife is praying about is, is I will receive a kidney. And I know I'll receive, but if, if I had to ask God, I, I'll ask him not to give me a kidney, but to fix the kidney I have at the moment. That's my prayer. And I'm believing for that. But like I said, God will always be there for you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And he will guide you through. And, and, and I believe that fellowshipping with people is one of the most important things in life. With connect groups or with your church. or That if you do go through something, there's always something that you can call. You know, it's not a mistake that you're here. It's God's divine appointment that you are here. You are here because he wants to heal you. He wants to, to talk to you. He wants to get to know you. He wants to to continue to ask you to trust him, regardless of what we go through. So that is it. I do apologize for the short preach. <laughs> but I just can't wait to sit down and, you know, get this over and done. <laughs> the more you get up here, I've done this so many years, the more you do get up here, the more you just don't want to get up here. <laughs> but God is always good. Um, before I go, I know that um, if there is something that you're going through at the moment and you need prayer, 
you can um, ask either Pastor Joel or Vanessa or myself or Anna with the crazy faith to, to pray for you. So um, one more thing. I know my brother-in-law is going to be very angry at this. Um, <coughs> this is why the tissues are here. Uh, Lorenzo and Anna, um, they, they lost their mom yesterday. I guess one of the hardest things that we face in life is losing a loved one. It's not easy. But for the people around you, I believe that, you know, we can get through this. So if you do um, have a time to, to meet with Lorenzo and, and Anna, most, mostly with Lorenzo, that... Um, you know, just to say it's going to be okay. You know, we can... Sometimes there are no words to express help when people lose their, their family. But in this world, people are dying every minute. And within that minute, there's actually either your name or my name on it. God will strengthen us through the situations we go through. And the many loved ones that we, we lose, we will be stronger for it. So just to, you know, just keep Lorenzo's family in your prayers. And, um, yeah, so thank you, guys. Pastor Carl and Nothing else, nothing else, 
Amen.